Song Revolution with John Chisholm on the NRT Podcast Network. Hey guys, welcome to Song Revolution again. This show is so much fun because I get to meet people and that's one of my favorite things to do is to make new friends. And today I sat down with Ryan Stevenson of Eye of the Storm fame. If you followed Christian music at all in the last few years, you know that great song. And I sat down here at the We Rock Studios, our sponsor for this show uh, today to talk with Ryan. I kept calling him Ryan freaking Eye of the Storm Stevenson, but we, we really had a great conversation. We went deep into some of the soul issues that he's dealt with in his life. He has an incredible testimony of how he even got started in Christian music by a lightning strike. And we didn't really talk too much about that because you can find that information on some other shows. Uh, so we kind of stepped around that and went into some of the present moment, really current kind of things going on in his life. He's got a great new record out called Able. The whole record is phenomenal. You really need to go hear that record. But we talked about some of the heart behind that record and especially talked, we, we got deep into how God reveals his intimate presence to Ryan. And it was just really a great conversation. So if you've been a fan of Ryan's or you're new to his music, I think you're going to really find this episode really deep and meaningful. Well, in the meantime, if you would do us the favor of liking and sharing and reviewing our show, that would really be great to continue to just share the love. And if you are an aspiring songwriter, I have a killer eight-week coaching and mentoring experience called NCS Pro Song Mastery that I would love to invite you to check out. We're constantly filling groups, and I would love for you to check that out over at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. Of course, that's where you can find blogs and articles and all of these episodes, about 100 and, almost 180 episodes now. So go ahead and jump over there and check that out, and I hope to be coaching you soon. So sitting down with Ryan was like sitting down with one of my heroes because I love the transparency of his music. Uh, he really has had some tremendous success writing for Toby Mac, writing with people like uh, Vince Gill and Amy Grant and on and on. Uh, but what I found in him was just a very genuine soul, someone who was really transparent and willing to share his real heart. So again, Thanks for being here, and uh, just appreciate you spending some time with me and my new best friend, Ryan Stevenson. Ryan freaking Eye of the Storm Stevenson. <laughs> How are you, man? Good. Man. What's it feel like to be you right now? Oh, well, what, I've, I've never been asked that question in my <laughs> life. Uh, it's, it's an array of... Uh, so many things grateful exhausted uh just working away aging mm -hmm. um, man just blessed i think i think I'm, I'm just in the swirl of like so many things in life that uh it's all it's all it's all good and it's all challenging mm -hmm. and it's all new but it's all uh, old at the same time. Mm. How old are you, bro? I am. I'm 44. Oh my god! I'm in the 40s, man. You're done, man. I know. It's done. Have you have you looked into reverse mortgage and assisted <laughs> living? <laughs> well, I'm trying to like. I'm trying to just be become a real estate tycoon now. I think. <laughs> Are you working for Keller Williams? No, no. I'm Not just yet. snooping around on my own, looking for. I don't know. Little. Houses to buy and fix up. Maybe I think that's my that's my next plan. A fixer side upper project. Yeah, fixer exactly. upper with Ryan Stevenson. That's upper. cool. What would the name of your flipping mm. show be? How about the flipping show? Yeah, the flipping show. Flipping off show. The flip. I don't know. Something like anything? that. Anything? No. I mean, that's pretty good, actually. Good. The flip off with Ryan Stevenson. I think it'd be fun. Yeah. Why, I mean, I think it would be catchy. Right, when you see it, you'd have to check that out. Yeah, you'd have you to. Would. When is that? Yeah, it kind of became a thing for a flipped while. Flipped off. That, oh, flipped off with Ryan Stevenson. 
<laughs> I like that. I like yeah. that. You know. Yeah. Oh, how fun. Well, dude, it is exciting to have you here and obviously such a big song, you know, and and in in a way, man, it's like, okay, that was uh Stevenson 1.0. Mm. You right? I mean, and you've it's been a minute, so got this great new record out, Abel. Mm. Wonderful songs. Thank uh, you, sir. Closer. Uh, I don't have a list in front of me, but closer and uh, name some of the tunes. They were all so good. Come, um, carry me, carry when me. We finally get there, risking it all. Yeah, oh, so good. Thank you. So good, man. What's your fave on the new record? Probably a song called "Carry Me." Mm -hmm. Just I then I think just because it was the last the last song that I wrote for it, and I kind of thought I was just done mm -hmm. with the record, and then that one was just truly a last minute. Uh, just the last minute Hail Mary, not even a Hail Mary, but I got, I got invited to go do a co-write with a couple guys. And I was like, ah, I don't, I mean, I'm done, you know, yeah, I'm right? done with my record. I'm exhausted. I, I don't think I have anything else really to say or pour in. And, but I just, I just did it. I was like, ah, you never know. You never mm. know what it, and mm. that day we, we got carry me and it just was like, it was such a sweet, I mean, we wrote it just that morning, and uh, it was it was truly like a just a prayer. Like one of the guys that I was with brought in this working chorus idea, and I was like, "Oh, we could." That's that's beautiful. Who were your co-writers on that? Uh, a guy named AJ Prius and Micah Kuiper. Nice, so yeah. Just those three. Can you like sing the chorus just for fun, just a cappella? I could. Why don't you do that? It's um. Uh, <laughs> It goes, carry me, Lord, won't you carry me? Yeah. Because all my weary is weighing down. Without you, I won't make it out. So won't you carry me? Jesus, please carry me. Because all the fire to me is gone. I need your strength to carry on. So won't you carry me? All my weary's weighing down. That's a great phrase, man. I love that. Yeah, yeah. that's sweet. I love the, the turn <laughs> on that. So, you know, what I hear in your music is a lot of compassion for people that have mm. been through a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And that comes, I mean, that's always been coming through in your music, you know, when I even listen back to the back catalog, but to proclaim, you know, God's able, you know, mm. to, to, to not just pull us out but to be present in all those different seasons of life and do you feel like you're shifting in your seasons right now from maybe the this the the ryan 1.0 to 2.0 I and mean, what do you feel is like different or, totally. or new or fresh for you right now <clears throat> first um, all this great music but no that's that's a great question and i love talking about that um i think i've always i've just always had a heart I get it. I'm, I get it from my mom. I grew up with a mother who was just, uh, just a nurturer, and mm. she was present and available to people. I'm the baby of our family, and I'm the only son, and so my mom and I were super tight. And I watched, I just watched her, my my entire life, um, be be involved. Like she didn't put up boundaries or barriers. She was accessible to people, and, and she. She just had a gift to meet people in their in their suffering. Mm. Um, mm. And, and I, sadly, you lost her mm -hmm. in 0809 to yeah. bone cancer. Mm -hmm. Man, um, that's got to just leave such a hole in your life. It, yeah. Especially it, as a nurturer. Yeah. And I'm a mama's boy, man. You know, mm. so uh, that it was hard. It's I mean, it, it was hard. Um, but I, it, no, I think that, you know. It's, it just feels like second nature for me growing up the way I did in the community that I did with a mother like I had that was just involved in, in real life with people to write about real life. Mm. And I, I feel like when you, when you speak to people where they are and you use music and song to do it, it, it sneaks past it sneaks past people's boundaries without really asking for permission. Love that. That's good. Um, and, Bypasses the brain yeah. and some of those filters. It just goes straight to the yeah. soul. I love that. And I just, I, I don't know. 
I just don't want to ever write at people. I want to write to people mm. and for people. I don't, I don't, I'm just not a songwriter or a, a minister or a musician that, that presents my art or my songs as something metaphorical that they got to kind of like think and figure out. Like I'm, I'm like as blue collar songwriter as it gets. Cause I want it to be like, I know exactly mm. what Ryan is saying. Now, do you ever feel your mom's presence and you kind of believe that, you know, someone who's passed can be present with us at all? Great cloud of witnesses and all that. Absolutely. You talk to your mom? I mean, yeah, in my mind I do mm. sometimes, you know, uh, my, she died right before I had, right before we had kids. So right before we had our first child. Did you were grown and married and I was kids. 30. Oh, okay. So we had, we waited, uh, my wife and I waited nine years to have kids after we mm. got married. My mom died just, you know, several months before I got, I got signed to a record deal and had our kids. Oh, man. And so it's like, it's, it's bittersweet. Like she's the one that truly nurtured uh, and fostered, you know, just the passion for music and, and the word of God and, and faith. How, how did she do that? How did she foster that passion for music? Man, she was, well, she wasn't much of a piano player, but she would always sit down and like kind of noodle on the piano um, and was always singing. Like she would just always walk around our house humming hymns. Like I grew up in a little country church mm -hmm. and, and we grew up on the hymnals. Like that's all we had. So she was always humming the hymns and singing the hymns and, um, just, I don't know, just being around her really did, uh, foster that love of, of music and expression and, uh, just, you know, joy in, in singing and, um, and just joy in community, honestly, being with, being with people. Wow. Now, is your dad still living? Are he you is. close to him? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. He still lives down in Southern Oregon. And my whole family is all still out in mm. Oregon. Uh, my dad is in his seventies. He's got, um, he's got Parkinson's mm. pretty bad and it's, it's progressing. And, um, so that's been, that's been tough. Kind of way on yeah. Yeah. Um, just, he's kind of lost his powers of speech now. So he can't, it's mm. really hard for him to talk. So it's, mm. that's you know, rough, dude. That's rough. Yeah. It's hard watching your parents, you know, I mean, my mother was one thing because we just knew like she was really sick and, mm. and, um, but you know, seeing my dad, my dad's always been so healthy and he's just so strong and to see like that thing that happens when you realize like, oh my gosh, like my dad, you know, he's aging, he's declining. He's got this, this disease that's, that's really affecting him and taking him out, you know, as a as a 40 something year old and a dad of three. And you know, it's, it's just, it's sad. It's it is hard. hard, man. You know, he's still in there, but it's harder to get to the real, yeah. the real dad that you've mm -hmm. known all your life. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm so sorry about that. Man. It's all good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So you got really pretty transparent on the, the Ian Morgan Cron podcast. It's like, <laughs> okay, this is like, we're getting down to some real stuff here with Ryan. Uh, uh, Enneagram four. Yeah. And so a lot of victim, a lot of romanticism, a lot of stuff going on. You guys were going at it. Did, did you have a vulnerability hangover at all after that show? You know, when you get into a situation like that and you actually, you actually find the courage to just talk about that stuff. And he, and man, he's just, he's so pulls good. it out. Of yeah, you, he does, yeah. That, that guy, man. But I think when, when you, when you go there, um, there's like, for me, there's, there's just this exposure and this healing that inadvertently takes place that you almost don't expect. And, you know, it's like I, on the other side of fear is freedom. Yeah. Well. And that's what most, we, most of us, if we're being honest, we stop right there and we don't want to cross that river because it's just, it's too hard and it's too exhausting and man, what's on the other side and. And I'm guilty of that, you know. Um, but when I did his thing, when I did his his podcast, and we just talked, I was like, man, what, you know? You kind of let it fly. What is <laughs> there? Good. What is there? I love like, it. What am I holding back? If, yeah. if 
if vulnerability creates more trust and not less then then why not just be vulnerable and and i feel like going into that i knew i've just learned for sure that the times i've been healed and impacted the most in my own personal life is when i've seen other other men and women around me just be vulnerable mm -hmm. and be transparent and confess and and talk about like crazy things and hard things that were happening in their life mm. and how they're navigating those things. I was like, and then in that moment, you know, the, I mean, the Bible says confession brings healing, mm. confess our sins to one another and pray for each other that we'll be healed. And that is, that is so true. Like a healing does, does take place in our vulnerability. Mm. And uh, what do you think is the biggest healing in your life? Man, this last season, honestly, uh, I'm, I'm on a path to just such a, um, a, a journey with the Lord in discovering finally in my forties, the heart of Abba, mm. um, the father's heart of God, you know, and I've grown up in church, in religion, my whole life raised in the church, raised in Christian culture, all of it, you know, speak the language really well. I know God's resume inside and out. <laughs> um, I know all the things about him. And I trust him completely, mm. absolutely. Um, but I feel like for a lot of years, uh, there's kind of like, I don't even know what else to call it, but like this almost hybrid offspring, this tormented spirit that's like, man, I, I God, I want to trust you so much because I believe in the efficacy of what you did on the cross and your blood was shed for me and my sin. And I trust you with that. And I know that I'm safe and secure, but I'm tormented because that just seems too good to be true. Like mm -hmm. I, so I just constantly work to try to modify my behavior to check boxes and jump through hoops because I'm just not quite sure where I stand with it, with a displeased God. Mm. And I think this last season, you know, when COVID hit us, um, it that was like a journey where I felt like the Lord in his goodness uh, stripped me away from all, all major touring, all people and, and normal, every anything normal and just said, we're going to we're going to go for a walk. And it began a, to this day, just a a a process of training my mind and and giving me being trained by an experience with god rather than uh rather than just reading about his accolades and resume and mm. I, I feel like i'm just continuously discovering and my heart is being pierced every day more and more as i yield to the holy spirit being pierced with this revelation that he is good. He can be no other. He is Abba. He is a dad. John 14 and 15. If you've seen me, you see the father. I'm beginning to just stare at that thought. Mm, yeah. And, um, you just said a lot, bro. That's, it's that just changing mouthful. Yeah. 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 So one of the books that impacted me the most in my entire Christian life is, uh, uh, Brendan Manning's, uh, Abba's Child. Abba's Child, The Cry of the Heart for Intimate Belonging. Has that been part of your journey? Yeah, I've read it three times. Henry in the Nowen, last... uh, Re Return of the Prodigal. And, yeah. Amazing. Sorry, didn't no, mean to I, get you off no, of Brandon no, no, Manning, I, but no, I mean... I love Brandon. That love was him. kind of the first time I saw that phrase for what it really was yeah. and realized my own heart was crying out for that in sense of intimate belonging. Because yeah. I love your, your phrase, uh, you can know God's resume, but... Take us a little more into the real experience. Like, what's that deep experience been like as God has revealed an intimate side of himself? Mm. I I guess for me, it, it has been uh, a daily, sometimes moment by moment response to the Holy Spirit. Because my propensity, when things are not going my way, like when when you really say yes to God and say, God, I, I just want to do whatever it takes. I want to be who you want me to be. I want to grow. I want to mature. I want to develop into the kingdom man. That That's like an open door on untethering you from all, this, all the pieces of security and identity that you've built up. 
So, so it's more of a mental mindset thing. Maybe you've had a narrative about who you are Absolutely. as a human. Yep. Some of the stuff that was in the the uh, typology <laughs> podcast, so we don't have to repeat that. But it was really pretty insightful. It's like, okay, I think I'm seeing into Ryan's soul yeah. here, at, in a very transparent way. So, is it behaviors? Is mm -hmm. it mindset? Is it you know uh, what? What is it that that might help us thought process trying to let go? Absolutely, you know, uh, thought processes that that. When things happen, uh, people let us down, we're not involved, we don't get invited, we're not celebrated. Like, because of my personality and the way that I grew up, I already don't feel like I belong anywhere. Enneagram 4, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm that. I'm and, so there with you. And so, when that's your narrative and you've lived like that for, for your life, when things go wrong in your life or things start happening uh, and you begin to be untethered from people and systems and uh, relationships or business things, the career wise, when those things start uh, un unfolding in your life and they're not there anymore, or they're not there in the capacity that you thought, man, th they, that should be working for me. And I, you know, I've sacrificed so much and I've worked so hard for the, for the rug to be pulled out. Like, God, what are you doing? <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Yeah. Where are you? And, and uh, well, there I am. I'm driving the ambulance. Exactly. I'm, I'm, of course this would happen. And yeah. I'm a, I, I feel like that victim again, that, that person that's just being let down and not celebrated mm. and not involved and not loved. Dude. Um, that's so right. Number four. And I feel like this season, the process has been. Yes, God just taking me away from big tours and association and, and alignment with pillars of identity that that have made me feel secure and safe and like I'm I am succeeding because mm. I'm here A, B, and C. And it's just been a process of being alone, being quiet, and having to deal with having to deal and face every, mo daily, moment by moment sometimes, the thoughts that come in that that feel very real because it is real, like it is happening. But I think the biggest thing is uh, the Lord just saying, all these things, all these things that you've, that you've put in place that, are, that you feel like are your source yeah. to success. Yeah. That mm. makes you valuable. They are not your source. Mm. Who is your source? I am your source. Radio stations playing your songs is not your source. Although I'm thankful for all that. I'm thankful for all the success. I think in this in this process, in this last season, there's this thing that's like, well, I did that. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I wrote a great song and it was number one for four months and blah, 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 blah. And now in this, in this untethering is the only way I know to say it. Uh, being being shown the heart of a good dad mm. regardless of my circumstance regardless of i just see it now because mm. i have kids yeah you right know? yeah like my kids ask me for things every day and i know well that will wreck your life <laughs> i'm not going to give you that you're mm. not ready for that you can't handle that i know you want it i know you think you're ready for it and i know it's it looks amazing and all uh, other people have it but that's, I know that that's not going to be mm. the best for you. And mm. with that heart posture towards Abba, learning to yield and trust, even in like, oh man, this is painstaking and I've, I feel like I'm missing out. I'm so frustrated. It's, it's like, I'm so frustrated with God sometimes, but I trust him completely at the same time. And mm. living in that tension and that paradox that's is... So Hard. I want to go back uh, just a little bit because that was so rich, man. Thank you for that. And, uh, you know, as as a fellow Enneagram 4, you know, uh, it's like I totally get where you're coming from. And one of the things that uh, the, part of the work that's been going on in my life is surrendering my sense of separation. Mm. 
you know, because part of the four is, you know, needing to be unique, yeah. needing to stand out. And, but the, the net result is separation because mm -hmm. I have to distinguish myself as the best at this or that or stand out or be the class clown or excel or whatever it is. And that can get pretty freaking lonely sometimes when you realize and look back on your life and see ways that you've, I have driven people away, mm -hmm. that I've really unintentionally in my supreme foreness have, you know, done a, done a crap job on my own life with people. So mm -hmm. learning to surrender that and being okay with maybe a little mediocrity in some certain areas. Uh, but I think even in my relationship with God, I think this is what some of what I'm hearing you say, uh, there's even been some sense of separation. If I can, God, can I say this and not get st struck by lightning? <laughs> you know, it's like some, I think I've separated myself from the sense of the presence of God mm. in some ways. And put God totally out there and needed, let me try to shift thoughts just a little bit here, needed, I, I think what I found out about myself is that I was using even God's affirmation to regulate my soul. Mm. Like the, the, the little, you know, like how when you're, you're playing a, a, a game on your cell phone or you, or you, you get a hundred pointer in words with friends or we you know something, but you get that little dopamine hit, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I found out is that I was trying to regulate, not so much with that. I'm not addicted to that, but I was more addicted to your affirmation mm -hmm. of a song I'd written or of a worship service I led or something I did. I, I, it took me getting to the bottom of myself eight years ago. I had a huge falling out in the church, a big falling out with myself and my marriage. It's just been, it was like, it was, it was the worst bottom I'd ever hit. And what I found out subsequently is that I was really depending on affirmation from people mm -hmm. to regulate my own soul. Mm -hmm. Right. Does that mm -hmm. make any sense at all? No question. And so I think some of that's, you know, just personality type. I think <laughs> some of it is being a public person, being a performer, being a worship leader, being a songwriter, being in the music business and really living for those micro hits mm -hmm. Of affirmation, mm -hmm. I don't know. Does that make any sense at all? Sure. I, I think that that some I got to the point where maybe even uh, uh, a, a, a sense of of God's approval, which I know this is kind of a weird kind of a fine line. Maybe I'm pushing the metaphor a little too much. I don't know, but I think sometimes we can use that too. Mm -hmm. Does that resonate at all? Am I like being no, crazy I, here? No, but I, you know, we make ourselves feel good rather than being real and I'm trying to bring it all the way back to you, you know, uh, the interview has been talking way too long now, but you know, to, <laughs> I love it. to kind of identify with what you're saying, you know, that, that uh, being untethered, yep. you know, being in that, that liminal space, if you will, between, okay, I've been trying to, to regulate myself to, I'm just going to launch out and untether from those things that brought meaning to my life mm -hmm. and let you be all. Yeah. <sighs> Crap. We're going to have to edit that out. That was like way too no, long. Man. But I, I get it. I get it all. And that's right. <laughs> so what do you use to regulate your soul? Man? How does my that... wife. <laughs> she and my wife is a, is a, I wouldn't be, there's no question. I wouldn't be able to do what I do without her. Mm. And, um, she's, you know, she's an Enneagram five, six, tell, tell us what those which are. is like a loyalist. Yeah. yeah like yeah. she's, uh, the thing that was so attractive about her when I met her was that she was not a roller coaster like me. Like I was just, I'm an emotional wreck all the time. Or like, I'm just, I'm very mm. led by my feelings, which I think that's what, and that's the way does. I'm crafted. Yeah, sure. So I can feel what. I can feel and write to that feeling, which other people are feeling. I get it. My wife doesn't, she's of course a deep feeler, but she doesn't go off on, you know, spiraling emotional tangents and, and, and has a whole day wrecked and is depressed 
with with something that sets her mm. off like I do. And so because of because of her stability and uh, her steadfast just a, uh, gifting to to be a rock and secure of, of who she is and who we are um, is mm. a huge voice of reason and security and safety for me. I mean, she keeps me on the rails all the time. Mm. Wow. Shifting subjects just a little bit. When you're standing up in front of people, either doing an acoustic set or if you do a band thing or, or whatever, what's that moment in the set that you feel like you're connecting with the people that are out there? Yeah. What's that one moment like? It's it's right in the middle of our set. And I guess I just learned years ago to like go out in front of people and just talk to people like I'm right in there. I'm sitting right out there with them. Um, years ago, I started, I, I got an opportunity to, to like lead worship. <laughs> I was never really invited to like play on the main stage and lead worship for like, you know, in the big mega churches or that kind of environment. I was always like, oh, you can go, you can go lead worship for Celebrate Recovery. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay. Sure. And so then I was in there with addicts and broken, you know, people who were uh, rec in recovery and, mm -hmm. and finding, man, when you hang out with those kind of people, you start, you start getting a taste of, of the joy and the grace of God uh, in, in such a different way. And so when I, when I just get on the stage, I just treat it as like, look, we're all in recovery. Accelerate here. recovery. Yep. Yeah. I, Good for you. Still to this day. And I, I treat everything as like we're all we're all in a stage of growth and recovery. So let's just talk about life. You know, I, I, I can just so affirm you in that because, I mean, a lyric like closer, 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 closer. I'm talking to someone out there listening, feeling like you've blown it, buried underneath the shame so deep and nobody knows it. I'm talking to someone out there listening, feeling rejected. Like you're too messed up and you're always stuck learning the same old lessons. <laughs> Dang. You know, looking for purpose in all this pain, looking for sunshine behind the rain. There's more to the story that we haven't seen. You know, I mean, unless you've been in that situation yourself or, you know, you've, you've got such a heart. It comes out in these lyrics. I don't know if you co-wrote this but or whatever, but, you know, to imagine you there on the stage connecting with however many people out there at this heart level and all the songs are like this mm -hmm. you know there's such a consistency in your lyrical content music's fabulous it's a great record Thank able you. so that moment must be pretty special for you yeah i just, for me it's like i i feel like i'm talking to myself mm. um, and not that i have some like crazy track record of addiction and you know uh you know moral failure or whatever like i just because i have struggled with with things throughout my you know young adult life and then to right now like i'm just i'm a person i'm as normal as it gets and i i just think that when you talk from a place of like i'm i'm going through this too um there's a moment where i talk about a song called no matter what and the first time I ever played that song was in, in a, inside of a prison. I had just written it. I'd never played it. Nobody had ever heard it. And I played it for a room full of female inmates. What's the chorus? No Take matter it. what you've done, you can't erase his love. Nothing can change it. You're not separated. No matter where you run, he's always holding on. You're still a daughter. You're still a son, no matter what. Mm. And that came from Romans 8 where Paul says, I'm convinced that there's nothing that can separate us from God's mm. love revealed in Christ Jesus. And that was really good news for me, even as a kid being raised in the church, because somewhere along the line, when you learn amazing truths about the love of Jesus, but then this other kind of like this hybrid ideology comes in because we're not, we, we, we look at things through a legalistic sense. We think God is the taskmaster. He's the celestial cast iron being out in the cosmos who was displeased with humanity. He's got a scowl of disappointment, but he sent Jesus to deal with your mess and to bring you back across this big chasm of separation. You'll always still be kind of a piece of garbage, but you have Jesus. So just wait around till you die and then go to heaven. And that I just that was always really hard for me to reconcile and to mm. live that way because when you live there in that in that fault in that sense of being 
I just, I gotta be obedient because I don't want my dad to be disappointed. That is such, that is bondage. That Mm. is not the gospel. That is not Abba's heart. Thank you. Um, but we try to live there. Mm -hmm. We do. We work really hard. And when you do, you got to work hard all the time to protect your image. And you got to work hard all the time to keep a lot of secrets. And Mm -hmm. it's exhausting. And that's why you see so much burnout Mm -hmm. all the time. You see Mm -hmm. so many problems, even inside and outside, inside the church, because, because we have our hearts. I, I believe it. We just haven't really been pierced with that revelation that I'm a son, I'm Mm. a daughter. And that's, I just think that's, that's what's been exploding in my heart the last Mm. three years is that, and that's all I want to trumpet now. I just Mm. want to say that message because that's, I've never been this free in my whole life. I've never been this free and this exposed and this healthy and and as hard as it is and as that untethering thing as hard as that is man there's there's freedom and there's life Mm. and there's healing in the when you're just in the place of so good yield man that's just that's just so good and that's showing up in your music and i think it maybe had been earlier but now it feels like it's so deep and authentic and such a great work in your soul. So thanks for, for being that transparent yeah. and vulnerable. So, you know, you're a man of many looks, you know, when I look back at some of all of your like PR stuff and your album covers and all that, it's like, man, you, I don't know, man, you're kind of like an international man of mystery. Sometimes you got the little razor mm, cut going little, on, the little skull mix. cap and your hair is long, your hair is short. You got your, you know, facial hair and not. It's like, what's next? What's next for Ryan? I don't Stevenson? know. I just got LASIK surgery. Did you? I've I've worn glasses for thirty some odd years, and wow. this last season I got so tired of because I'm really hard on my glasses, and I mm-hmm. felt like I'm always having to right get a new pair of glasses. And so I looked into some LASIK. I got it done. Did I you? have eagle eyes now. I don't even want to think about what it's like to have your eyes pried open and them doing crap. That just does not It's sound unnerving. Fun. I can't imagine. That sounds mm. like torturous. All right, last question, bro. What's the one song you'd take to the moon and why? You only have one song. One of and mine or just It doesn't matter. doesn't matter. It can be one of yours. But like this is eternity. All eternity. One song and why? What a great question. It would probably be... An Imperials song. R. Memorales, all those guys. And Russ Tapp. Russ, yeah. Like, those guys are like Russ, the Imperials, major pioneers, major was it influence. Old like, Buddha? What, which Old one was Buddha, it? Pra- probably a song yeah. called Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He can work yeah. it out the praise. Classic. Mm. Classic. Probably. It would be one of three songs on on the Imperials. We only get one. Then it would that's the be, rule. Okay, then it would be a song called "I'm Forgiven." Uh, I'm forgiven. Now I might have a reason for living. Yeah, Jesus keeps on giving and giving, giving till my heart overflows. Cool, Ryan. Freaking Eye of the Storm, Stevenson. Man, this has been great fun. Thanks for being here. Yes, sir. Hey, thanks for joining us on the show today. I hope that you'll jump over to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. Check out all the resources there to encourage you in your own songwriting. And if you like what we're doing, why not share this episode out on your socials? You can find the link in the show notes. We'll see you next time.